Hi, and welcome back. This is Lesson 4, Part D. Joe returns after four more weeks. His blood pressure is down to goal, 130 over 80. He's lost some weight, cut down smoking and drinking. Um, and he's walking a mile most evenings after work. And his lipid profile has returned. His lab chemistries are within normal limits. We're happy to hear about that, um, that his electrolytes are um, stable. We did know that if we put him on the ACE inhibitor, which we probably would, and the hydrochlorothiazide, that he would have some potassium and sodium loss from the, from the um, diuretic, um, either chlorthalidone or hydrochlorothiazide. Um, and also, um, the lisinopril has a modest um, a potassium um, sparing effect. Um, so we may have some changes there. Um, and um, so think about looking at his lipid profile. What do you see? And um, what do you think about just in general knowing what you know about cardiovascular risks, um, what his risk may bring you? Um, he's a guy who's a smoker. He's um, losing weight, but he's heavy. He's a drinker. Um, a lot of things um, may impact his cardiovascular risk. So, of course, we go to the experts and we look at his actual risk assessment online as we alluded to earlier and I'm going to take you there now. So um, here is the ASC risk estimator plus. I'm going to roll the screen down so we can get into the thing and I'll enter his um, data. Um, he's 49, he's a male, he's white, his blood pressure was 130 over 80 um, and his total cholesterol was uh, 208. His HDL was 40. His LDL was 138. Um, he's not diabetic. He is a smoker. Please note here that they talk about um, when you hover over the information sign, you get some more information. Um, and they talk about cigarette smoking um, and so forth. But there's, there's other um, forms of tobacco, such as chew and also um, the um, the e-cigarettes, you have to think about those as well. He is on hypertensive treatment, not on a statin, and we're not going to consider him on aspirin therapy, even though he probably took some buffered aspirin in the past for his um, pain. We probably asked him to decrease that because of its impact on um, his um, blood pressure. Um, and we don't have previous visit data, so we have to go here. Now, in this case, um, he's come up with, over, over the, the um, he's got a 10-year um, risk at 11.5%. So that's over that threshold of 10% for treatment, which we already knew. And his lifetime risk is fairly high at 69%. Um, and optimally, a person his age, his um, risk would be very low. So he's clearly at a higher risk. So let's look at his therapy impact, and um, I keep moving the screen around because it doesn't quite fit, um, but basically these, in general terms, they want to make sure his blood pressure continues to be lowered, um, and um, his LDL um, alone dictates um, statin treatment, which we'll talk about in a minute, and of course, stop smoking, and of course, um, the lifestyle. And again, they don't really have ways to measure lifestyle like exercise and weight control and things like that. In these tools, um, we only can use numbers, so it makes it tough. But quitting smoking, um, it's really fun. This is a great tool to use with patients in the room as you show it to them on your device and then you go through the, um, the scenarios of what change we might come to at this 11.5%. If he quit smoking alone, he could bring it down to 8.4%. If he, um, if he uh, started the statin, we take it down another couple percent. If he started or added blood pressure, which he's already on, so it doesn't change it too much. Um, but then also aspirin therapy might help a bit too in terms of, again, all we're trying to do here is reduce risk. Um, so um, the, um, this is a great tool to you know, kind of add and subtract. Well, what if you don't quit smoking? All right. But you do these other things. Well, yeah, that still helps a lot. Um, I don't really encourage that a lot. I try to push them to quit the smoking. So just one more comment about the risk calculator that, um, that we just did. If his LDL was over 190, 
or his he had current cardiovascular disease, all bets are off and statins are recommended. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do the risk estimator and use it as a teaching tool. It simply means that at that point, um, the, the the estimate of risk is kind of a, a moot point. So we, we think about lipids um, and whether or not we should treat. Um, we have stratified his risk. We think about targeted therapy, um, and, and it includes all the pieces of therapy, and also the risk of treatment because the drugs um, that we that are really kind of the only ones indicated in these protocols um, are the um, the statins, and they do have side effects and adverse reactions. In particular, um, the um, the um, adverse reaction of rhabdomyolysis, which is a serious and life-threatening problem. Um, it's rare, um, but its um, its symptom is similar to a less um, dangerous um, symptom of, my, of um, muscle aching. Um, the rhabdo does start with that, um, so we really have to be careful. Um, many patients do experience mild muscle aching, and sometimes it can impact their lifestyle and thus make the drugs um, unacceptable. Um, within the class of statins, um, they're pretty much the same um, pharmacologically, but I do find that sometimes patients respond to one drug a little bit better than others, just in terms of um, side effects. So I'll wiggle them around, and we'll talk about the statins in a minute. There are other medications as well, um, and um, you can choose to go off into a different direction. There are some fibrates, um, on the market um, that do treat um, uh, cholesterol, and they, they work kind of more in the gut and pulling the um, lipids out and taking them out through the feces, um, and then niacin as well, which um, which has a lot of kind of weird side effects in terms of flushing, but has some effect. Again, neither of these um, are anywhere close to being as effective in terms of lipid lowering um, as the statins. Um, a person who has isolated hypertriglyceridemia, which is often associated with hyperglycemia um, or di diabetes or prediabetes, they really need to actually have different drugs because the statins don't do much for triglycerides. Um, and they would get into drugs like actually the fish oils um, are something that they would, would take. Um, so that's, um, that's a little sidebar. But in this case, when we talk about lowering LDL, which is kind of the target um, component of the lipids, we're talking about statins. Um, and of course, as always, we took look at interactions. I will make note here that of the statins, there is only one, which is prevastatin, prevacol, um, and it's cheap, which does not have um, itself metabolized in the CYP450 system. Um, and the reason that's not like the top of the list as far as um, drugs of choice is that it is less potent than the kind of um, model drug of atorvastatin or Lipitor. So this is kind of a little cartoon that, that talks through the uh, mechanism of action of statins. Bottom line is basically we're reducing serum LDL. Also these other two elements which are not often reported in lab um, testing, um, but they do, um, do work on that. Um, and um, there is some effect on HDL. Remember that HDL, or um, we want that high. It's good cholesterol, and we like to see a higher HDL and a lower LDL, and that makes it easy to remember H for high, L for low. So here is a nice little chart that I keep handy, um, in my, at least in my brain cells, because I've kind of gotten used to them. But um, we see that atorvastatin, of course, kind of wins the prize in terms of um, being a common drug that's reasonably priced out there. Uh, Resuvastatin also is there, but um, that in terms of getting that high intensity um, therapy, that's really going to be the drug of choice. Now in the middle, in the moderate intensity, we have a lot of other drugs that show up. Again, our friend Provastatin is in there, but you got to take 80 milligrams, which is the high end of the dosing for that drug. Um, before you get the effect. Um, and then um, simvastatin, which is also, and lovastatin are all, are both on $4 lists around town. Um, so those are often ones we go to just to get people into that moderate intensity therapy. Low intensity therapy isn't really recommended as much anymore, but we will find that some people can't tolerate the higher drugs, higher dose of the drugs, 
and we will start them low um, and try to see if we can push them as high. We don't do a lot of testing of the um, LDL over time to see where it goes, um, like we do with some drugs and therapies. We really try to push the person to the recommended um, intensity of statin treatment based on their risk profile. Um, and, you know, it's kind of one of those wishy-washy things where, yes, we do kind of check the cholesterol levels, but more importantly, we check safety labs. I do that after about, oh, 12 weeks, maybe even a few more months. Um, to be sure that they um, are, are not impacting the liver too strongly um, so that, um, that the drug is safe for them. And so now, what if um, five years pass, um, and this happens all the time, you receive a fax, or of course, in these days, day and age, most of you will receive an EMR um, alert that Joe has been to the ER, he's gone for chest pain with exertion, he was admitted for observation. The myocardial infarction was ruled out, but he had some ischemia probably going on. He had stable angina or angina. Now, what drug do you think cardiology would have prescribed at this point? Well, I'll tip you off. It would probably be one, one of the nitrates, nitroglycerin, either short-acting, and probably in his case, that's what they'll give him, short-acting under the tongue, or there is a spray, which is more expensive. Um, and this drug works um, you know, it seems um, intuitively you might think that the drug works by dilating the coronary vessels, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, and it works by reducing um, afterload out in by reducing peripheral vascular resistance. Now, when you think about that, and it works very quickly, um, it works great, but what it does is it drops the blood pressure fairly quickly. And I always tell patients, if you're going to try this for the first time at home, you should be seated um, or laying down before you take it because when we give it in ER, sometimes we watch those blood pressures and they plummet. So you want to be careful because it will make them faint feeling sometimes. Um, we do want to be um, uh, uh, careful, um, especially interactions with um, um, a popular drug among males, um, Viagra, um, as it has a, a, a severely additive effect. I'm going to ask you to think about patient instructions. How are you going to actually prescribe this and instruct the patient to take the medication of short-acting nitroglycerin? Um, there are longer-acting formulations. If he was um, over the long haul having a lot of um, episodes of angina, we would probably, and even um, more of an unstable angina, we would have him on a long-acting nitrate, either a patch or um, um, an oral prep. Oy vey, another five years passes, you receive a report, um, he's had a, a ST elevation, uh, myocardial infarction, so um, again, now he's, um, he's had a heart attack, and he is, of course, in heart failure, which is not surprising given all the things that have been going on, and this long-standing hypertension. So check into the YouTube, I'll let you do that from the readings, um, that will help you prepare your CHF mind map. When you look at your mind map, I want you only briefly, and there are uh, careful instructions posted, but briefly look at patho. Um, determine um, the pathways for um, those with preserved ejection fraction or um, diastolic heart failure um, or reduced ejection fraction or um, uh, systolic heart failure. We used to use terms like left and right-sided heart failure. We no longer use those. We now talk about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or huff, roof, and that with preserved ejection fraction, huff, puff. Um, and then, so what? Um, of course, this is all about pharmacologic therapies, and we want to take a look at the goals of treatment and the mechanisms of actions for each of those, of course. This is a great tool to help you take a look at the kinds of therapies Primary care people are going to mostly focus on stage A and B here, the preventive, um, and then our cardiologists are going to get involved once a person does have structural heart disease and symptoms of heart failure. And we're going to talk about this, of course, more later in terms of diagnosing, but right now I want you to focus on medications. And the medications, of course, hit various parts of the circulatory um, system in terms of preload, reducing um, afterload, preload, um, helping um, the, the positive inotropes, um, helping the pump, 
and then reducing blood volumes with diuretics such as the um, Lasix.